We thought, what better way to explore the idea of space than in being in the DIA's newly renovated Kresge Court? And I'm not going to say too much about that, because I'd rather invite up um, Brad Frost from the DIA, who's going to tell you a little bit more about it. And Brad, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Bethany, and welcome. Uh, good morning. So, uh, my name is Bradford Frost. I'm a Detroit Revitalization Fellow. I've been with the museum now uh, almost two years. And when I was brought on board, I was asked to think about ways and develop ways to deepen the museum's connection to community and economic development in the city. And that led to a wide-ranging exploration of all the possible ways that you could try and achieve that mission. But the real opportunity was to try and look at what are the core assets within the institution and how do you link them to those community and economic development opportunities nearby? What is that intersection? And so early in my job, this Art Place America uh, opportunity presented itself and it's about creative placemaking. And the idea of creative placemaking is what is the intersection of arts, economic development, and place? And thinking very specifically about the DIA, I would tell my colleagues uh, when we were in the planning and ideation phase of this whole process, you know, I'm a focus group of one, but I lived next door at the Park Shelton for three years, and not once in that time did I think of this as a place to come hang out, grab a meeting, work. I only thought of it as a place to come on special occasions to impress my wife or my mother, or when a new exhibition came online. And so, if you'd been in this space any time up through April of this year, there was something very incongruent with the ballroom type furniture that was here. It was um, just not consistent with this magisterial place. And there was something very inconsistent with the way it was used. We'd have a handful of people here during the course of the day. Some would grab coffee, but people didn't really feel like this was a place for them to go. So the larger vision was, how can the DIA position itself with local residents and professionals and students as a place to go hang out, grab a meeting, and be uh, connected or take advantage of the opportunity for creative inspiration. And while you're here, build a relationship with the museum. Go explore the galleries. Do whatever, uh, whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable and invited to the space. And really deepening that invitation so I wrote a concept paper called The Cultural Living Room. And if you go to Art Place America, you can read all about uh, the blog and the process that we've gone through over the last year and a half in that design effort. But really, when you think about that vision, uh, there were a couple of things I knew I wasn't very good at. And one is interior design. Uh, you know, just because you know what you want to achieve, you have to also attract the right talent and resources to the table to execute that vision. So part of our whole grant application was to go through a very thoughtful design stage. And even beginning last August, we uh, reached out for a competitive bid, and we were thrilled with the initial concepts and presentations of Patrick Thompson and his firm, Patrick Thompson Design. The reason we needed a design support to this whole effort was to really facilitate a change strategy, moving from this rental-driven program, ballroom-type furniture, to a more fixed footprint in a place that people feel welcome, invited, and inspired to really realize their potential relationship with the museum. And so we brought Patrick on board uh, in September. We hosted some community uh, design charrettes, some staff design charrettes that really just handed the reins over. And Patrick did a marvelous and magnificent job weaving through the demands of the institution and its goals with the demands and 
aspirations of our community stakeholders that took part in that design process, as well as working with a whole host of uh, diverse partners. So this morning is really about Patrick and the way he saw that through and the core ideas that really influenced his design process. It's really a privilege to have you all here. I hope following this morning, you'll think of this as one of your favorite places to go, grab a meeting, have a meal, or even work instead. You're welcome here for all Detroit, Wayne County, Oakland, and Macomb County residents. This museum is free and open to you. Uh, and so please enjoy your visit. Feel free to absorb the rest of the galleries after this morning, or stay here and hang out. Uh, with that, Patrick Thompson. So I had a wonderful slide presentation planned, <laughs> and then it dawned on me that we didn't really plan a space in here to project slides. So now I am, uh, have a nice written document, and I'll be going back and forth just winging it and reading off here. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about myself and about what we do, um, about my firm, um, why we love what we do, and what we did here in Crisby Court. So quick background on me, uh, I grew up in a family that was kind of obsessed with material culture and found objects. I had a father that was an artist and a uh, mother that was a historian. And um, they kind of made a big deal about everything, whether it was designing a birthday cake or a Halloween costume or whatever. We were always taught to really take in our surroundings and kind of sweat the details. Um, and I, you know, I think that at a really young age, you know, I was taught to appreciate process, and I'm going to talk about process today. And, I, you know, I was taught to appreciate process, and I think the designer in me was born at a really young age just by watching my parents and kind of how they celebrated these, these things. So, um, sorry. Um, so, to, you know, to me and to designers, the process is where the solution is born. When you get a project, you immediately you walk the space, or you meet with the client, and you have you immediately have all these ideas of what you want it to be, but it's really during the process phase when you meet with your team and you sit down and you start going over the, going over what the client's identified as a problem, what you've identified as the problem, what, what the item or the space dictates, and then you know through that process you kind of really start problem solving. And that's that's what design is to us, you know, interior design, product design, industrial design. It's problem solving. So um, this is where I would refer to this slide and this picture that's not here of uh, my dad carving, he, he carved these little wooden figures for an artist, she, she's a 2D folk artist, and you know, she contracted him, he's an extremely crafty man, and she uh, contracted him to make these, these little sculptures um, from her 2D art. And I, I started thinking about you know, what it was like to grow up around that, and sure, the finished product, he carved decoys, he sculpted, he painted, and the finished product was always pretty amazing, like people were always blown away. Then I started thinking about what I was more kind of blown away by and drawn to, and it was the process. He would he'd really sweat the details, and you know, even though he was a craftsman, um, I don't think he ever referred to himself as a designer once, but he would draw everything in plan. He would draw, he would draw 2D elevations, he would do color studies, he would pin this stuff up, and he would do little 3D mock-ups, and I remember he was carving a, a, a decoy one time, like a duck, you know, and there's, there's a lot of people that that's a huge deal, but then it was decoy carving. And, uh, he had three little heads and he did paint color studies of the head and you know like finesse the feathers and just had them there and it was just kind of funny that he would you know it was funny to his kids to have like these weird duck heads that look real just sitting around the house all the time but he would just study those things and I remember you know we were huge skateboarders and we want to build a skateboard ramp and he'd say well what does it look like and you know he wouldn't he wouldn't let us just dive into anything without he'd say we'll get some paper and pencil and draw it and show me what it's going to look like or give me at least let's work through it together so just always drawing, just forced us to do process, and I don't. I think it was just, you know, it was just an intuition for him. You know, I don't think he was trying to teach us process, but maybe he was. Um, he made us pay attention to scale and proportion, even if we were drawing superheroes. And I, I'm, I'm not going to keep going on this for too long, so don't worry. 
but he would like, you know, if the head was too big or the arms were too big, he just taught scale and proportion how important that is to design and what you're designing, you know, no matter what it is that you're doing. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I don't think he ever considered himself a designer. He was more of a doer. Um, so, you know, I, I think I learned pro process at a very early age. So, with that kind of upbringing, originally I thought the only way to get into being a part of the built environment or contributing to the built environment was through the more of like the craftsmanship side or the construction side. So, um, you know, I originally I, I went to school for historic preservation for restoring old buildings, and I went to uh, you know I worked as a carpenter for a, a, you know all through you know high school and then through college, um, and then I remember I was. I started noticing, I was at the, you know, working on these construction sites, I still hadn't found what I loved or what I wanted to do. Um, didn't really ever, didn't even know interior design. You, know, just, you don't hear it all the time, you don't even know like interior design exists. You know, now it's more trouble than ever with everything on TV and everything. But, and I was on these job sites and I was you know, like an apprentice or just growing a little bit into like a journeyman. And I remember when the architects and the owners and the designers would have these meetings on site, you know, every Monday morning they'd do like a 10 a.m. meeting where they would see the progress. And I would always place myself like way awkwardly close to these meetings. And whether I was sweeping or working on something that didn't need to be worked on just to pay attention to listen to what they were talking about. And I remember they would always identify problems and, you know, I, I kind of always thought I had way better solutions and answers to whatever problems they, they were addressing. And, you know, you couldn't say anything because I was just the weird guy pushing the group, standing too close to them. But, I did occasionally like chime in and everyone would just look at me like, you know, who is this guy? So from that, it, it, it's kind of when I, I started doing some research about becoming an architect or, you know, and then that led me on this path of what interior design, an interior designer does and, and whatnot. And that's when I knew what I, you know, I had to do. So I interviewed a bunch of interior designers and architects. Um, and I already had one degree that I didn't do anything with, so I figured I wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. So, um, and then I realized design was kind of more up my alley. So. Um, I moved to Chicago and I went to school for design and I loved it. My carpentry and construction background was extremely helpful studying design. Um, where I went to college, I went to Harrington College of Design and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I met some amazing talented people and uh, I met a gentleman who became a bit of a mentor to me. He was a teacher, his name is uh, Joe Pagula. He's here, but we'll, he's here for a lot of different reasons. We'll touch on that in a second. Um, so I worked for a firm there, it was great, but I always knew I was going to come back to Detroit. I wanted to do design work in Detroit. So I moved back to Detroit, I think in 2006, and uh, you know, after a few different contract positions trying to figure out what was right, I really wanted to do work in the city. And that's not as easy, to do, get a design job in the city is not as easy as, as one would think. And I turned down these jobs in the suburbs and then <laughs> realized that was a huge mistake. But. Uh, you know, I worked in design within reach, which, um, you know, at the time it seemed like it wasn't, you know, but it taught me sales, it taught me appreciation for furniture, trying to talk someone into buying, a, you know, $6,000 sofa isn't always the easiest to sell, but when you, when you learn, you know, why it costs that much and you explain to people, once again, visiting process and craftsmanship and the importance of it. Okay, so, where are we? All right, so, yeah, around 2009, I decided to launch PTD. And I had very few projects that were my own that I could even have a website. So I remember I, I had uh, done my folks' basement years back. So I had my friend who's a pretty good photographer photograph my folks' basement. And Claire Nelson, who modeled the, I don't, I don't think she's here, but she bartered, uh, she built my website in trade for me designing her loft here in Detroit that I professionally had that professionally photographed. And my own loft that I lived here, I had photographs. So I had all these projects that looked like. You know, they were these these paying clients, but they weren't. They're my parents, barter project, and my own. Um, but it led to me actually landing a, a pretty big gig. I, there was this um, uh, a couple in Birmingham that hired me. Um, we talked on the phone, and the, the husband and I, we, we, we jived pretty well. And he hired us to uh, do their kitchen. And I, you know, I said, oh, I can do the, the GC, the building. I, I'll build it. I'll, I'll do everything. And they, luckily, I only had one job at the time because there's no way that we could now and it took way longer than it should but we ended up at Birmingham Kitchen they, they kind of took a chance on me because it was just me at the time and we ended up winning the Detroit Home Design Award for that kitchen it was third place but still we won an award for, in, for it was like it was like third place for a kitchen under 250 square feet or something um, it's great and that wasn't that long ago actually I still love that kitchen but um, 
Yeah, so then we decided, okay, this is it, or I decided this is, this is something, like I think we can do this. So it was 2009 and the economy was terrible, but you know, it, I had someone who really believed in us and loved the project and they were happy. So just kept going and um, it just kept growing. So um, let's see, so yeah, after moving from one spare bedroom to another, to a basement, um, I had, you know, that's another thing about, in the city of Detroit, the network of people here, people knew that I started my business, so people like, Peter Van Dyke and Claire, and so many of you that are, you know, here, and um, Claire, uh, she, you know, took a chance on ETV when we were pretty young, and we got a few bigger projects, which led to, like, Skidmore Studio downtown, which is, you know, that project has gotten a lot of uh, publicity and whatnot, so then we ended up joining the DC3, the Detroit Creative Corridor Center, which um, was just so instrumental in the growth of ETV. They really helped us legitimize our business. Um, from that, you know, talking with Bethany and Matt, we kind of had to realize that I needed some support. I couldn't do it all myself anymore because I'm just not good enough at most of the things to even do it all myself. So I had to hire, you know, I, that's when I found Mary, who's here. She's part of the PTD. I, uh, I went up to CCS's interior design floor and walked the halls and looked at all the different um, students' work, and I found what I thought was the best, which fit our style the most. I took a picture with my phone of her name on the tag and tracked her down, and, uh, Mary is now on board for almost two years. She's in the back. Hey, Mary, good job. And then, uh, so then we're still, you know, throughout this whole process, the gentleman that I mentioned before, my mentor, Joe Pula, um, he was helping me behind the scenes, kind of like, hey, Joe, I'm about to spend $7,000 on these people, people's countertops. Can you at least tell me if you think, you know, you like them or, you know, you think it's a good idea? <laughs> so, uh, almost four years later, Joe has now moved from Chicago to Detroit to be uh, work with PTD full time as our design director. So there he is. And uh, so that's pretty huge. So now, you know, we, we have an office here in the Auburn um, in Midtown, a cool little space about 900 square feet right around the corner from a lot of our projects. And uh, we have a book, you know, a bookkeeper and account manager. So we have, you know, there's four of us now and an office dog and a little space in Midtown. And it's awesome, man. We've just been rocking and rolling. So. That's about me, PTD, the firm, the process, why we love what we do. Um, I don't really care about what we love. So I know it's you know cliche and trite to say, but I love what I do for a living more than anything in the world. I'm so fortunate that I have, I have found this path. Um, and I think what I love about it is first the process, but then also the relationships. Um, you know, Brad's a client, we've become really good friends. Claire was a client, we've become friends. So many people become friends in it. When you design something for someone, it's so personal. You just, it's a real intimate career. And you just, you're in people's homes or in their spaces. And it's, it's just, it's just very personal. I love that about it. You know, it's, it's a way to put people, you know, in, put people first, you know? And I really like that. And I like to find out problem solving with people and making sure, you know, at the end result, no matter how great something looks, the client doesn't love it or it doesn't function the way they want it to. So it's, I guess the success wasn't. Um, so I really haven't paid attention to this very much, but let's see. Um, so I guess I would say that whether you're designing a space like Kresge or a shoe or a lamp or a light fixture, you know, it's all about the process and that we take the same steps to get there. And no matter what, the end result is to have something that people are proud of, that they love, they love to share. And nothing makes us happier than hear people talk about, you know, kind of bragging to people about their space or showing off something that we helped them design. So, all right, to Kresge. All right. So, cool thing about Kresge, this project came in as just an email. It, it wasn't on the radar, I didn't know anything about it, and an email just showed up one day. And uh, I believe, I don't know, it was from Brad or from, Henry, from Tim Burns, but, um, and I remember reading about the cultural living room, and it was, I think it was our first RFP, maybe like our only RFP, so an RFP is a request for a proposal. And, um, I remember thinking there's no way that, you know, I can't even imagine who this has gone out to. There's no way we're gonna get to, you know, work at the DIA and work at Kresge. But, you know, I, I think Matt Clayson probably had something to do with why this ended up in my inbox, but it did, and thank you, Matt. And, um, but I figured someone, you know, it's in the inbox if someone thinks we have a chance. So, um, we took it real seriously, and I was leaving, I think, the next day to go to LA to visit my brother, and I was on a plane, and I just started making a list of everything that could, came to mind about Chris Porter in a space like this. And I should back up by saying, like Brad had mentioned, 
all the community engagement that they did on the research for Chrissy Court, what the community wanted. Um, they worked with NBS and held a full design charrette um, prior to my involvement, kind of getting, finding out what the community wanted, what uh, the team members, you know, there was already a full team kind of assembled before I even came on. Um, they just needed someone to make sure that it all worked. So um, when this thing came to me, it was already coined the cultural living room. And, um, you know, so I started making this list based on, and my list was outdoor space, um, greenery, structured European garden, uh, tall ceilings, flooded with light, and, you know, and then I kept having to come back to the fact that it had to be a living room, you know. And if you look around here, you took all this comfy, cozy furniture and stuff out of here, it's a pretty tough space to make a living room because it's all hard surfaces, it's huge, tall ceilings, and there's really nothing cozy, there was nothing cozy about Crazy Court Pride. Um, so that was kind of like, our, that was identifying the first problem. How are we going to make Kresge Court cozy? Um, in, the, in the RFP, they said they wanted to reflect kind of a, a Great Lakes culture, that of a hotel lobby where people want to come and stay. And that was, that was really important. I mean, you know, I can't emphasize this enough. Sure, if someone comes and sees it, that's great, they like it. But the idea is that you stay, you know, and that was really important. Um, so I made this list and you know identified the problem. And then we, I did a written statement um, in my proposal. And the written statement had a lot of the jargon that I'm using now. We talked about a way to kind of close in the space, which is tough. So we did a, a room within a room was one of our first comments that was in the written proposal uh, that like structured European gardens using the boxwoods. Um, a blend of modern and traditional furniture. And I'm gonna touch on all the, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through it in a second. And the plan came next. The plan was almost simple because we had such a strong written concept of what we wanted the space to be, and then there was already so much process done. Um, so let's see. Yeah, and we submitted it, and we got it. It's so cool because usually you submit these things for a project, and it takes forever to hear back. And you're always wondering if, if you got the project, and they must have been on a tight time frame because I think Brad like called me two days later, and I I've never I swear. You know how everyone is now on the phone in their cars. I actually pulled over to take a phone call, if you can believe that, because I was so nervous whether I, we got it or not, and Grant, you know, broke the good news that we did, in fact, you know, we're the, the selected design team to do Cresby Court. So, a really cool thing about this project is uh, our original concept and floor plan is really close to what you're seeing. Those of you that are designers and creatives, you know how that's not always the case. You know, you can, it's one thing to have a, a, a concept or a design that's strong enough to get you the project, but have one that's strong enough that actually gets implemented like six to 10 months down the road is, is pretty awesome. So I mean, we have, you know, the, pro, the, the program had been written, you know, in design you have to have a program with how many seats they want to sit, they want to have a cafe component. And the process here, we had the plan, we had the direction, and the label, the cultural living room really set the direction for the space, you know, that, that label, label, that brand really, was really helpful to us because they're, they're, it didn't let us kind of stray too far from what the, you know, the, the end result was gonna be. Um, so we started by identifying the team. Um, they already had a pretty strong team, so it was Graham Beal, Henry Erickson, um, Brad Frost, Elliot Broom, Elliot, you know, everyone brought something really unique to the table, Elliot was with Four Seasons and Ritz Carlton forever, so he had this, he had a lot of like ideas and stuff that you, you see really got implemented in the space because he has that strong hospitality background. Um, so the team was assembled and all the people at the DIA, um, PTD team, NBS, they're the furniture, the people that we pr that provided all the furniture, was, um, they were helpful as well. Um, and let's see, that's kind of, you know, everyone brought something really unique to the table and then craftsmen and the makers, and I'll get into the specifics, you know, and I, I'll go quickly. I don't know how we're doing on time, Bethany. Are we good? Okay. okay. So, once again, the cultural living room set the direction. As you can see, everyone's in kind of a different type of seating group. I'm going to walk you through this. Um, and each seating group kind of contains a different type of furniture, whether it's traditional or modern. And the idea behind that was we wanted it to seem like a real living room. You know, someone's real living room doesn't always just have, I mean, sometimes you see, like, you're looking online and you know, even with like Great Barrel and all these you know companies now you see that everyone's they don't want these spaces to look sterile they want them to look lived in and collected and that's really kind of what 
we were trying to do that this was something that would evoke emotion in all different types of people. People that are connoisseurs of art are also tend to sometimes be connoisseurs of furniture. So when they would come into the space, they would see something like the womb chair or the Turner, you know, wishbone chair. It'd be excited to sit in it or touch it. It's, you know, nowadays it's more more available than ever, but that wasn't always the case, and it's still like all oh, you know, a lot of stuff's very expensive. So we don't have a lot of these pieces that we would love. So come here and sit in these expensive womb chairs and whatnot that you want to sit in that you, until you can move on your own. So um, I'll start the, the far back corner. Um, over there, that's a collaborative space in the, the, the back, back corner. Um, so that is a piece of furniture that was provided by Coles, which um, they're, they're kind of like the upper echelon brand um, from Steelcase. Um, they're, they do a really beautiful job with their, their furniture. And the cool thing about that, we originally called that the pit, greatest, you know, name for the area you want to sit. So, uh, we're calling that collaboration corner today. Um, but all the furniture over there has power integrated into it. Um, and then it's kind of the best seat in the house. You can sit in that corner and really sit back and look at all of the Kretzky. Um, the fabric on the back um, was, you know, that, talk, so we, that took some talking into, but that is from Alexander Girard, who was a um, textile designer for Herman Miller, you know, and, you know during like, I think, 1950 to the 70s. Um, and it was inspired by the, he would, he would go to Spain and the flags of Spain, so that fabric was inspired by. Um, so then you have the cultural concierge, which is over here, and I know I've asked your name a bunch of times, but there's our cultural concierge. So the idea behind the, the concierge is that when you, you know, people, a lot of times you have visitors from out of town or whatnot that are coming here, come here, feel comfortable. Once again, that hotel hospitality idea that you could ask for a place to go to dinner, a spot in Detroit to go, and you have your own concierge here. Um, the desk at the concierge was um, designed by PTD and then built by a, a local craft, craftsman here in Michigan, up in northern Michigan. Uh, then you move to this area, which we're calling the lounge. So the lounge is made up of these Chesterfields, um, custom-made tables also with power integrated, and the boom chairs. Um, went back and forth on the boom chairs. Some people felt that you tilted back too far on them. Some people thought they were just right. But we, the idea was like, we just wanted to have a type of seat for everyone. So sometimes someone might want to sit in a womb chair and go back and reflect on the ceiling a little bit or read a book or you can kind of, womb chairs intended to curl up too, like you're in the womb, but keep your feet off the womb chair. <laughs> um, so then the center, we call this the structure or the trellis. This is kind of the heart of the space. This is the, the living room component of the space. Um, we knew that we wanted to create a room in here just for scale and to ground the space, which is funny because, you, you know, the height of it was studied and just kind of exhausted on how tall it should be. And the idea was that this room is in this space, but it doesn't block the eye of the room. It doesn't take away from the architecture or the ceiling. So we created this room, room within a room. Um, it's kind of inspired by a semi-private dining room. You know, if you go to a restaurant now, back in the day, you rent a room in the back hallway and you had like, hot and weird back there. Now, no one wants to be in those rooms. Now people want to be, you know, in somewhere where it's their own space. It's semi-private. It's still seen, you know, so that's kind of the idea behind the center cultural living room here. There's paper tables in the, mil in, in the middle that those are those tabletops with big, huge, like, post-it notes where you can, you're supposed to be inspired and sketch and draw. Um, it's all, you know, encased by the, the boxwoods, the, the boxwood hedges to kind of just give it some rhythm. If you stand back outside of Presby Court and look through the arches and look in, the green hedges, they set the tone and the rhythm. They start there, then they happen again, happen again, and then the green bank heads on the back kind of take the visual, take your eye from there all the way you know, across the space. Um, and the cafe component was a, a, a large component of this space because even though the furniture groupings are not supposed to be moved and it's not really a, a I don't know if it's a rental space anymore at all, but if it is, it's kind of based on the terms of what you see. This is how, and there's the DIA likes to have these um, art talks, and dinners where they still have seating minimum. So our cafe component and our seats, you know, we still had some requirements and programming that we had to, you know, stay within there. Um, and then here you have the marble tables and the coles. I think it's um, it's called the retro bay chair, which this chair that you're sitting in. Um, it's kind of for us. It was our little breath of fresh air, the, the tulip garden, the pop of color with the sculpture in the space. And 
I believe those chairs were inspired, probably probably a lot of you have seen the uh, Bertoia chair, which is a wire chair made by um, Harry Bertoia, produced by Noel. Um, so this chair was inspired by that. Um, and then the library tables, kind of one of my favorite things in the space. Uh, I saw this image of the Boston Public Library, and it was this grand room that really reminded me of Kresge Court, and it was just real, it had this nice rhythm of library tables that just went kind of marched throughout the space, and each one had two of like the, you know, the traditional brass lamps with like the green glass, so this was kind of our, our nod to that, but then those tables all have, our, they have a strong technological component with power, and there's iPads built into them, which have interfaces which are hooked directly to the museum. Um, and those tables are meant for people to come sit and stay, whether you have a, a meeting of six to eight people, or if you want to have a dinner party or a work meeting. The lights, the lights up, uh, up top, if you look, those were a strong component of those. We reached out to a local company called Luminart to um, help us with the lighting. Um, that's one thing I would say, you know, as a, as a designer and fellow creatives is, you know, it's one thing to kind of have an idea of what you want or don't want, but depend on the experts because um, you have to, because you can't do it all. I mean, I know when we started talking about the lighting component, I immediately told the team, well, that's, you know, I can advise and give my input on what I'd like to see or not see, but we need to get an expert in here. So we went to Illuminar, and the idea behind these lights, you know, is they're extremely flexible. They allow us to wash the walls. They allow us to pinpoint furniture. They have a theatrical component, so if there's uh, um, performances, we can, you know, you can get lighting from those as well and kind of spotlight the performance. But then the coolest thing, and it's it was pretty innovative. A lot of times you would think in a space like this, you would immediately run things on the horizontal um, to wash walls just because that's what you see. Well, Illuminar came up with this idea, why don't we take that and tilt them vertically and create these kind of suspended beams because when you look up, they're actually a lot less intrusive because your eye kind of still goes right to the ceiling and just goes past them. So your eye kind of goes up the light fixture. So something like that, you know, it's weird. You're kind of meant to not see it, but when you look up, you see how cool and custom and design they really are. Um, so I think that is my little walking, standing from the podium, this is my first time on a podium, I think. Uh, walking tour of Presby Court. I think that's it. So I hope that you guys were um, inspired by what I said in the process. So I think I think Brad's going to come up and we'll be happy to answer questions if people have any about the space or the process. Yes, yeah, so we thought we would invite Brad back up. So um, I would encourage questions for Patrick about um, his career, his work, his creative process, anything you want to ask, and, and Brad as well in terms of the space and the DIA. Here you go, guys. Any questions? Sure. Um, Um, let's see, locally sourced. So, in terms of most of the craftsmen and everyone who built everything, everything was local, product-wise. Um, Steelcase, NBS, so Steelcase, um, all the coal S stuff, I believe. Michigan. Michigan, yeah. Locally in Detroit, um, Detroit-wise, we try. <laughs> so one of our, uh, interesting components when we hired Patrick. Um, we were quite proud of him being a Detroit-based business. It's like being a designer that was based out of the city. Um, and so the, you know, the investment in his team and what they've done. Um, so that was actually a relevant part of our evaluation of what was going on and just something that we were really proud to say, we can hire local talent to execute on this job. Uh, again, Matt Clayson is responsible for uh, introducing Patrick to our team around that process. Um, and so, you know, it speaks real volumes, I think, about the emerging talent of what's happening here. And yeah, so uh, local, 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 in terms of materials is different, but the talent is right here. Just in terms of your RFP, when you're so much energy, at least for our company, goes into the RFP, and how much sketching do you use? Can you, can you elaborate a little bit about 
Yeah, there's always that question, how much work do you do on the front end before, if you don't know, you're going to get the job. So that's, and, and for a small firm, that's tough. Something comes in and it's this project that could make or break kind of your firm and, you know, how much work do you do to get the job. Um, and we kind of will usually do, so when we do a project, we, do a, we, we always do a conceptual phase. So if someone was to hire us, we would give them a conceptual presentation. And for an RFP, we probably just do a streamlined conceptual presentation. So um, always a plan, you know, so always something in the floor. When I say plan, I'm usually referring to a floor plan, furniture plan, so we'll always do like a plan. Um, usually a collection of images um, to show a visual representation of what's achievable, mood board, yeah. Um, but we don't get into renderings and stuff like that. And then if there's some key, like if there's a key component, um, for this one, for this particular one, it was just a plan, a written statement, and then some conceptual images, and then one little 3D um, SketchUp model of just this structure, like, which is really funny, because it was like cedar with ivy growing up, and it was really not good looking at all, but, um, sorry, Joe, Joe did that. But, um, <laughs> so that's a real fine, that's a real good point. How much do you do before you know you're gonna get the job? So we'll usually throw, you know, we usually, I, I kind of put it in hours into it, let's not spend more than 20 hours on this, you know, so that's kind of how, we treat that, but if there's something that's a big feature that's our selling point, we'll sketch that or elevate it. Just to kind of, yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's you know that's we had to. Um, that's really tough to put together like a fee structure when you don't know what the project. So we usually do like a big range of what this project could cost because you know you could based on the furniture and based on the product and the people involved. So we'll just usually do it with the cost analysis, I'll usually just do like a rate of what we anticipate a project could cost. And I usually just plug in like basic numbers from past projects or something like that. So, yeah. so it's a little different. It's not during the RFP, but uh, in a similar capacity, you know, our initial concept paper went to our place and then we became finalists and we were given a hundred days to write the complete proposal and I think something that goes, uh, will go overlooked by a lot of visitors here is what a substantial change strategy this is for the institution. And we had to really negotiate and really weave through our concept design. Uh, I personally spent hundreds of hours engaging the internal stakeholders about what would change here. So the rental program was gonna go away in terms of your ability to reserve the space during normal museum hours, right? And so even during this event, we were saying to the uh, DC3 team, you know, this space, once the museum is open, has to be available to anyone to walk in and enjoy. And that is a change in thinking from, you know, it's closed off at the whims of a private donor. We changed the programming model. We changed uh, from a really flexible footprint to a fixed footprint. We emphasized the invitation to local visitors over you know, all those sort of more privately driven interests. Right? And I appreciate Patrick's sort of acknowledgement of the cultural living room, sort of that concept was a real uh, critical asset to the whole driver. Right? For me, the question was, how do we break down the marble walls here to encourage people to frequent this space the way they would their favorite coffee house, because it's not the easiest place to navigate internally. And so the invitation is really key, right? And the positioning is also really key. And so when we prepared the design brief, right, you're just trying to weave together and balance those contradictions of uh, historical expectations that people had with this new vision and really seeing through that new vision. And so, uh, we tried to balance that as best we could so that when Patrick was preparing his proposal, he was able to deliver on a clear vision as opposed to severe contradictions, right? And there are tensions in the room about dining, study, gathering, you know, cozy comfort, but there is also a need for volume, right? You have to have enough space for 100 people and things like that. So there are drivers to that process that then emerge following the RFP. With, that's interesting that Brent said that because with that in mind, we have, we responded to this design brief that was written with, and I remember sitting in the meeting with the floor plans 
and people saying, well, what about this? What are we gonna, how are we gonna move this? How, when, when we have the, the gala, when we have a, the event, when we have a wedding, how, how are we gonna move this? Is this stuff all on wheels? And like, I had to say, well, no, this stuff isn't meant to be moved. Remember, like, I came in here under the assumption that this stuff is supposed to be stationary. I mean, everything you see is wired to the floor. So moving this stuff is, is not an easy, uh, an easy task. So um, the design brief, and like I said, the, the amount of work that was done when this project came to me, they already had a really clear idea of exactly what they want. So we just had to kind of bring it all together. So, anyone else? Uh, my name is Steve. I uh, work at Team Detroit. Oh, I just had a question um, regarding, I, first off, I think the space is beautiful. I think you guys have done a wonderful job. Um, I love the hedges and some of the cues to the outdoor, and I think, you know, obviously it really works in this kind of courtyard space, but I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that and why, and maybe some of these elements that we might not notice, or why it's important, and how do you not kind of overdo those little aspects? Um, Thank you. So, Kresge Court at one time was an outdoor space, and I believe in like 1972, um, a ceiling was, Yamasaki put a ceiling on it, and then I think in the 90s or 80s it was replaced by the uh, home of those dates. So, this was an outdoor space at once, and we were looking at photographs, and, you know, the, and it still has the feeling of an outdoor space, and we really wanted to kind of evoke, you know, that was kind of like that, just that design problem that we had talked about, how do you make a space that seems like an outdoor space, a cozy living room. So um, our kind of nod to the outdoor space in the past of Kresge Court was through this trellis structure, something that you would, you know, visit in an outdoor garden. And the greenery, once again, that, like, immediately when I came into Kresge for the first time, I thought, wow, this space seems like it should have, like, a beautiful boxwood, almost like one of those boxwood mazes, like in Shining, you know, like crazy. Um, throughout the space. That's just what it, you know, that's what it seemed like should be uptight to these walls. So, um, thank you for noticing that, and that's kind of why this green, and, and that's a really good point, how do you not overdo it? Because something can get a little bit, um, you know, it can just get overdone. And You know, a space like this, you have to, remember I worked for these um, two women in Chicago, and I would design stuff all the time, and they would always say, it needs another layer, it needs another layer, and I hated when they said that, because I'm not like another layer kind of designer, you know, kind of. But, um, Kresge did need another layer, you know, so things like the carpeting that you see, those were custom, you know, they're very traditional carpets, and they were custom, like the pattern was selected, but then they were custom colored and custom sized for Kresge Court, and they have a real traditional feel, but that was like that layer, these boxwood hedges are another layer, um, and I mean, we wanted to do decorative pillows, that would have been our other layer, but we kind of thought that we could get away with the pillows, so. So, uh, the community design charrettes that we performed sort of revealed the profound spectrum of possibilities. Uh, we had some really inspired and outrageous ideas put on the table from creating, but you know, conceptually good ideas, not just they were never going to happen, right? So one, one example was a, a butterfly garden, and another example, you know, a dog park. All right. So the you know, and my personal bias for the museum was, you know, what if we hold WrestleMania, right? And I would just stretch the, the, the boundaries here to recognize that actually what we're just trying to do is cultivate some, a new vision about how to utilize and think about this space, realizing we never put a moon bounce or a wrestle, you know, match here. But the idea is, you know, what are the expanded boundaries? One thing, you know, the conceptual vision and the actual execution of it, aesthetically, you know, the way I imagined it was much more minimalist, right? But I think my role as a facilitator from how you think about that vision, the way it is executed, was trusting an expert and empowering Patrick and the NBS team to co-create. And what we did by bridging a couple designers in that process was we created creative tension and useful exchange and dynamics. And also, I think to be really transparent about it, our museum director, our COO, and our uh, vice president for operations who have that hospitality background, they were the three aesthetically, uh, princi aesthetic principles, right? Really trying to maintain what is core to the museum and what can we uh, really lean into with an innovative design and, and
process. And so Patrick had to persuade them, and they played with the details and refinements and certain elements that were elevated or not, right? Uh, so aesthetically, that team played a really constructive role. But I think the core idea that Patrick delivered an indoor-outdoor garden cozy the initial concept was very consistent and it really helped uh, build confidence in trusting him to go through that process. So he had a really strong rapport with the principals, the museum director, the COO, and the vice president of operations. So. Guys, thank you so much. And if anybody does have more questions, I would encourage if you'd stick around and talk to anybody who's wanting to learn a little bit more. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Stay tuned to make sure you grab one of those um, info sheets on the way out so you can stay updated on all the events and uh, more will be coming soon. Thank you.